And now, please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When we look around and see the problems with the society today, it's tempting to think that these issues we face are recent issues. Oh, everything was better before 2016, <laughs> or 2008, or 1980, or any other date you look to. Things were better in the past, we tell ourselves. If only we could turn back time. It's even a song to that one. <laughs> if only we could go back to the good old days, all would be well. I know I've fallen into that before. I'm sure you have too. But I have to admit, when we think more clearly about it, we realize that the roots for so many of our problems are deeper than that. So many of the things that affect us as a society did not arise yesterday or even five years ago. They have their origin in the way in which we view our world and our universe, and ourselves, for that matter. And to understand that, to understand the roots of this Western mindset, the good and the bad, we have to take a close look at Christianity and the Christian tradition. There is far more there than most people, particularly secular people, realize. The legacy of the Protestant Christian tradition matters. It matters a lot, a lot more than people think. Much of this goes back to the Apostle Paul. Ah, Paul, our good friend, the Apostle Paul. Women oftentimes have issues with Paul and with good reason. Paul, or at least the letters attributed to him, said that women should be silent in church, not something that we like here, and that only men should have leadership roles. We have a deacon that's right beside us. <laughs> uh, Paul, or at least the words attributed to Paul, urged women to be subservient to their husbands. Gays have also had issues with Paul and the way his writings have been used to marginalize gay people. But to focus on these few select problematic passages ignores some of the more profound ways in which Paul's writings have shaped Western society. Plenty of other societies, unfortunately, have been awful to women. Plenty of other societies have been discriminatory towards gays. There are other aspects of Paul's writings that are worth examining closely. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul writes beautifully about the gifts of the Spirit. Quote, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How wonderful. We should all seek after these virtues. But Paul contrasts those gifts of the Spirit with what he calls the works of the flesh. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and to add before measure, he says, and things like these. So <laughs> extend the list even more broadly. It is a long list. But it's worth noting here, here's the thing, it's worth noting that Paul does not contrast the gifts of the Spirit with those who do not have the Spirit. He sets up an opposition between spirit and flesh. This contrast that Paul sets up between the flesh and the spirit is a consistent theme through his writings, particularly in his magnum opus, The Letter to the Romans. It's hard to overstate how influential for Western culture that this contrast has been. Paul's flesh and spirit dichotomy was picked up by Augustine of Hippo in the fourth and fifth centuries. Heavily influenced by the writings of Plato and his students, Augustine made this dichotomy central to his, to his theology. The body and its desires, bad. Repress them, hate them, all the bodily desires, from sex to eating food to basically any enjoyment that you have whatsoever, all bad. <laughs> then a thousand years later, Martin Luther came along. Luther was an Augustinian monk before he started the whole Protestant Reformation. He was steeped in the writings of Augustine and passed Augustine along to the rest of us in Western culture. Luther framed the flesh-spirit dichotomy in terms of the law and the gospel. The law, 
as the impossible moral demands of the Bible. Luther tried for years to achieve moral perfection, but his flesh, his body, prevented him from achieving it. Then, after reading Paul, he had a spiritual breakthrough in which he realized that we are all saved by the Spirit and not the flesh. The Spirit grants us grace through faith. Luther sets up this tension, a tension that has far-reaching consequences for the past 500 years. On the one hand, you have the law, what God calls us to do and live into. The flesh prevents us from achieving this, so we must live by grace. But the law does not go away. It's always there. So we live in this tension. We're supposed to strive. We are supposed to constantly strive for impossible moral perfection, but not be crushed by those expectations because we are saved by grace. But we're never at ease. There's never a time for rest. It's a striving, striving, failing, striving. The same tension found its way into the writings of other reformers in the Protestant Reformation. In the classic Calvinist tradition, your salvation was determined by God before the foundation of the universe. For those who are members of the elect, i.e., those people going to heaven, you have a moment of regeneration when you are convinced that you are saved. But, and here's the big point, if you are a member of the elect, that will be clear in the way you live your life, by how closely your life reflects the impossibly high moral demands of the Bible. A member of the elect, after all, never lusts after anyone who is not his or her spouse. A member of the elect shows compassion at all times. A member of the elect never flaunts his or her piety. You always turn the other cheek. You always go the extra mile. You always take the narrow path. In practice, this means a constant striving after moral perfection. You have to prove to others that you are a member of the elect. You have to show that you have total control over the body. You don't give in to the desires of the flesh. If you do, you confess that sin and then strive to be better, praying for the Spirit to give you the grace to make it so. Now, do you see how impactful this framework is for Western culture? People blame Victorian values for Western hang-ups on the body and its desires, but it goes back to Paul, and more importantly, the Reformation interpreters of Paul. You have to strive, constantly strive, to defeat the desires of the body. Now, in the 19th century, this framework took a new turn. In that time, there emerged something known as post-millennialism. Now, I never said this sermon was going to be an easy one, so it's fine. <laughs> Post-millennialists argued, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, I mean, you should be. <laughs> Post-millennialists millennialist, millennial, millennialists argued that we are now living in, we are now living in the thousand-year reign of Christ predicted in the book of Revelation. So pre-millennialists think we're living just before. Then Christ comes in the clouds, boom, sets everything right, and ushers in the millennium. Post-millennialists are like, no, 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 we're already in the millennium. We're not waiting for Jesus to come in the clouds to set everything right. Now, because we're living in this millennium, it's up to us, the Christians, to transform this world into the kingdom of God. Creating the kingdom of God was our responsibility in the here and now, guided by grace, of course. Suddenly, this striving, this uneasy, dissatisfied striving took on a societal dimension. You had to push yourself endlessly, push your body endlessly, control and use your body to build up the kingdom of God. All the 19th century reform movements, from prison reform to education reform to abolition and prohibition, were all part of this post-millennialist model for creating the kingdom of God. Your own desires had to be put aside. It was about selflessly striving all the time, onward, ever onward. What, you're feeling burnt out? That's a weakness of the flesh. The elect, those who truly have grace, don't let the flesh get in the way. After all, you have the kingdom to build. Does any of this sound familiar? I have to confess that I am as much a victim of this mentality <laughs> as anyone else. Uh, MJ is giving me a hard time for this from time to time. I had it drilled into me from a young age that I must always be striving. We have to work endlessly for the kingdom. I must constantly be repressing my desires. Those are signs of weakness. 
This, it must be said, was probably the worst mentality for a closeted gay man, but... <laughs> and then after I came out, this framework, this way of viewing the flesh and the spirit, didn't go away. The flesh and spirit are at war with one another. The righteous overcome the flesh and start new endeavors. You plant new churches, you volunteer whenever possible, and you're always there for others. We must push, push, push. This legacy of the Protestant Reformation, what Max Weber famously called the Protestant ethic, tr truly turned demonic when it was removed from its Christian roots. Instead of building up the kingdom of God, the secular goal became earning more money, getting more things, getting ahead. Why are you killing yourself to earn more money? Don't you have enough? Enough? There is never enough. You must consume, consume, consume. Your ability to earn money and consume demonstrates your moral worth, after all. Your ability to sublimate your desires, the desires of the flesh, demonstrates your worth. Now, only now in this secular framework, people are not seeking the fruit of the spirit or building up of the kingdom. They're seeking more money. Now, the downsides of this Protestant ethic, this Western framework that goes back to Paul, should be obvious. Americans are constantly stressed out. I would take a show of hands, but that would be, <laughs> everyone would just raise their hands, so it would be pretty straightforward. Uh, we work far too hard. We are riddled with anxiety and depression. We live in the wealthiest country that the world has ever known. But that amounts to wealth. Has that brought us happiness? What we've been seeing in our society over the past few years is the result of this framework turning on itself. When meaning is not found at the other end of the rainbow, i.e. in more consumption, where is it found? It's found by striving for your team, for your side, politically or otherwise. Now, of course, there are obvious benefits, at least in terms of capitalism, to the Protestant ethic. This need to demonstrate your dominion over your body's desires. To constantly work, constantly strive, never be satisfied, drives production. It's great for GDP. But at, what, but at what cost? Now there are shelves, literally shelves, of self-help books dedicated to working through our addiction to striving. But so often these books miss the underlying framework on which it's based. So what are we to do? How can we move forward? How do we actually find happiness and, ex and escape this constant war between our souls and our bodies to demonstrate that we have achieved salvation? Now, for the past several sermons, I have been preaching on insights I gleaned from my sabbatical, and particularly from the month I spent in northern India. As I've said, one of the great benefits of experiencing another culture is that it helps us to see some of our own assumptions that we often miss. Because it turns out that the way we view things in the United States is often radically different from the way that other cultures view things. And religion has an enormous impact on this. Now, Hinduism sees the relationship between the flesh and the spirit in very different terms than Christianity does. In Christianity, it has historically been framed as a conflict. The flesh and the spirit oppose one another. It's up to us if we have enough grace to control and suppress the desires of the flesh. Hinduism, on the other hand, acknowledges the desires of the body. The desires for food and enjoyment are real desires. But the aim in Hinduism is to have everything in its proper order, its proper relation. It's about achieving harmony between the body and the soul so that the needs of the body can be kept in check and allow us to elevate the soul. Hindu spirituality, the practices of yoga that I preached on two weeks ago, are intimately linked with the body. Hatha yoga, the yoga we think of, is by its nature bodily. The various positions that you practice allow you to be in touch with your body, and in so doing, to have an appropriate relation to it. You're trying to open up blocked energy within your body. Another yoga practice focuses exclusively just on breath. There's an entire yoga school that focuses just on the breath. Breathing exercises that calm the mind and allow you to be in touch with the divine. There is an acknowledgement of the interrelationship between the body and spirit. They are not at war with one another, but work in tandem. And the same can be said of other yogic practices. 
The goal is to train the body and the mind, again, as I said, so you can elevate your soul. Now, lurking behind these two different approaches to, re to the relationship between body and spirit are two different perspectives on God. The classic Protestant Christian view on God conceptualizes God as holy other and transcendent. God is up there in heaven and occasionally comes down to earth to interact with the world. The world, according to classic Christian doctrine, is fallen. Suffering and death are consequences of the fall in the Garden of Eden. Creation is therefore, while good, flawed by human sin. And you must overcome this sinful creation in order to find God. Now in Hinduism, on the other hand, God the divine is imminent in creation. This is what gives power to darshan that I talked about several weeks ago. Darshan or darshan is sight, or sight is the merit, the grace, that is derived from gazing on and being gazed upon by an image of God. In a very real way, God is present in that statue or idol. You partake of that divine essence by viewing the sacred statue. In Hinduism, creation is not fallen and wholly other from God. The divine is present and infuses creation. Therefore, the body is not inherently sinful. It can be both a source of sin and also a source of grace. It depends on having the body in proper harmony with itself and your soul. Now, Hinduism has nothing like post-millennialism. Hindus are not working to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. And that itself does have its own negatives. Uh, instead, it's about liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth, when your soul can become one with the divine. The striving in Hinduism is about striving for spiritual practices that bring harmony and the ability to have the body in its proper balance. Exhausting your body, therefore, which is what we do all the time in American society, is counterproductive. It goes the opposite way. Why would you work yourself to the point of burnout? That leads you away from God, not towards God in this Hindu framework. Now, do you see how, how impactful these two frameworks on the body and soul are? You see why they might matter so much? It was just this comparison that was going through my head as I read our passage today in John 6. John chapter 6, in that chapter, John the Evangelist uses one of his favorite rhetorical techniques in which Jesus is speaking on one level and the people don't get it and they're on this other level. The crowd does not get what Jesus is trying to say. Now this scene follows on the famous feeding of the 5,000. Jesus has provided food to all those who need it. Inherent in that feeding is the acknowledgement that the body matters. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 is a good thing. Providing food is sacred and holy work. Jesus knows this. But then he tells the crowd, do not work for the food that perishes but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. In other words, food is all well and good, but it's secondary to our true aim, which should be devotion to God. The people want to know what tasks they should do. This is great. I mean, this is like, you couldn't make this stuff up. They want to know what tasks they can do to achieve eternal life. I want my to-do list. You know, come on, I got to cross one off so I can get there. But Jesus corrects the crowd. This is the work of God, that you believe in him, whom he has sent. It's not about doing this or that work to achieve eternal life. What you need to do is not something external, but it's something internal. You need to believe, and belief here is not just assenting to a certain creed, but having faith, the kind of faith that shapes your life and your whole being. If we are to form ourselves, our lives, as disciples of Jesus, that's what we need to do. Now, if we're able to take a Hindu perspective, it's about practicing yoga, developing spiritual dis disciplines, and that can include helping others. In a similar way, the growing of faith in the Christian tradition is a process. Yes, it involves a birth into new life, but that birth can emerge over time. Jesus himself is the bread of heaven. And the crowd, again, mistakes Jesus' words. They still seem to think that the bread is something tangible that they can eat, but it's not. I love this perspective in John 6. The chapter opens with the feeding of the 5,000, the acknowledgement of the needs and desires of the body, and then it progresses to say that the work of eternal life must go beyond that. It must be internal soul work. Now, this reframing of the mind-body dynamic is something that Christian theologians have taken up since the mid-20th century. 
Theology does change, believe it or not. Partly through the interaction with other faiths, including Hinduism, Christian theologians have sought to, have sought to reinterpret the Apostle Paul. They have tried to read Paul in ways that do not create the opposition that we have, what we have inherited between the spirit and the flesh. They wrote about how, how Paul's conception of the body, Paul's conception of the body is far different from our own. When you actually look at the Greek words that he uses, words like body, flesh, soul, and spirit, they all meant something different in the first century than they mean to us today in the 21st century. And so we can't properly interpret Paul without a better understanding of first century notions of the body. Now, I won't go into this now, because that sermon's already a long one. <laughs> but if you want to know some book recommendations, I can offer them to you. And process theologians, those people that I like so much, process theologians have been particularly prominent in this reframing of the body-soul dichotomy. If you recall, process theologians argue that God is not transcendent and wholly other. Instead, God is imminent, moving within us and through us. Creation is infused with God's presence. You can see there are similarities to the Hindu perspective here. Process theologians reject all language that talks of domination either domination of the other or domination of your own body. It's about harmony with others and with our bodies, seeing the web of connection that links us together. We need bread that feeds us, but we also need the bread from heaven, Jesus, the embodiment of compassion and love. Process theologians distance themselves from intercessory prayer, where we ask God to come on high to help us in this world. Instead, our prayer life should aim to connect us with others and to ourselves. Our prayer life honors the divine energy that is in each of us and works through us for healing and wholeness. Process theologians present an entirely different framework, and I would argue that we need this framework if we actually are to find relief from the harmful culture in which we find ourselves now. This perspective, this religious perspective that I've been talking about, I would say is one key to finding healing and wholeness in our society. We should not aim to live in a world of endless competition where everything is a zero-sum game. We grow and develop and thrive through cooperation where the sum is greater than its parts. This is why our faith matters so much. It is quite literally the answer to what ails us personally and as a society. The hymn that we are about to sing derives from a poem by John Greenleaf Whittier that Whittier wrote after what is admittedly a limited exposure to Hinduism. <laughs> now, while Whittier misinterprets Hindu practice in the larger poem, his point is one that we are well, well advised to take to heart. Whittier scolds those who use intoxication of one form or another, or those who embrace harmful asceticism that punishes the body in order to find God. The path to God instead lies through a life of discipleship, one that is rooted in wholeness, harmony, and prayer. It's a path that reflects the best of Hinduism and the best of Christianity alike. If you wisely take the words to heart, perhaps you too will find what you're looking for. Listen to what Whittier writes. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. <laughs>